don't be just outcome driven i think a lot of people particularly now in these three years i see have become increasingly outcome driven and obsessed and if you want to do this for a long period of time you will have different types of outcomes and you have to weather the bad outcomes to live to enjoy the great outcomes so if you only want great outcomes then you will not be ready to face the bad outcomes Hello and welcome everyone. I am Vishal Khandelwal and this is the 1% show. This show is an open-ended exploration into the minds of the wisest people around to help us learn to think, invest and live each day a little as little as 1% better. You can learn more at safalniveshak.com or vishalkhandelwal.com. My guest today is Shyam Shekhar, the chief ideator and founder of I Thought Financial Consulting which he founded in 2008 and which now provides financial planning and portfolio management services to investors. Sham is also a past president of Tamil Nadu Investors Association which works in the space of investor awareness education and protection. He is a chemical engineer by qualification and has also completed a one year resident management program for technologists at IIM Bangalore. I have known Sham for the past 10 years and a quote from Paul Coelho where he says be brave take risks nothing can substitute experience. I think that aptly summarizes whatever I have known about him. Tossing up between studying economics and engineering sham initially reluctantly took on the second but after completing engineering his earlier calling returned when the hunger and curiosity of economics and business took over hanging around with fellow investors who shared the same passion he spent the next few years thinking economics and stocks every waking hour of his life equity research in india was an evolving discipline then that was early 90s and setting up a research desk was the next logical step for sham which he did but what made it unique was that he never sold his research research was proprietary and used by a small group of investors with shared beliefs and values being an independent thinker with set values and beliefs sham took a conscious decision never to work in any company knowing that it made sense not to work in an environment where the values mismatched he dreamt of building a clean consulting business in investment strategy on his own but the 90s were early days that left him with investing as the only option so building a proprietary portfolio was the way to go researching businesses spotting opportunities building portfolios and now helping others manage their money well this is what sham has spent most of his time over the past 3 decades and he has done really well at that and not just that he's one of the rare few successful investors in india who has openly shared his learnings with others through his articles videos tweets and podcast and i am highly grateful for this act of his with this and no further delay sham i welcome you to the 1% show thank you so much for agreeing to do this thank you for having me vishal it's my pleasure sham so sham let me start with a recent tweet of yours uh, on someone else's quote so the quote read i had a mother who taught me there is no such thing as failure it is just a temporary postponement of success quotes closed to this you tweeted that your mother has stood like a rock behind you all all the time you've talked earlier about your professional background and what got you into investing but i want to start a conversation with your life prior to that your growing up years and the lessons you learned from your parents before starting your career which still guide you in life uh, i'll start uh, with my mother at a time when uh, everything had a conventional uh, thought process to it like you are supposed to do something very predictable very directed and very precise to create a future for yourself i was a very unconventional uh, person in the sense that i tried many things uh, if you take sports i would have played multiple games uh, if you take extracurricular activities i would have tried my hands at multiple things i would have tried writing i would have uh, done a lot of uh, cultural activities i would have tried my hand at composing music learning music uh, i would have tried debating i would have tried multiple things so i was not a person who was easily uh, directable so in that sense i'm probably one of those difficult uh, kids of uh, that era which is the 80s and uh, my 
family had a certain specific expectation which is that i should um, study whatever it takes to later use in our business which was into manufacturing paints so the conflict between what the family wants out of you and what you want to do was something uh, which was balanced by my mother most of the time because if she did not give me the freedom and if she did not believe in letting me do what i wanted to do a lot of skills that i acquired at that age and a lot of experiences that i collected along the way would not have come my way itself because i would have been stopped from doing many things uh, which uh, would have not given me the perspectives which uh, later helped me in life and also my uh, interest in uh, the stock market uh, which i developed just after completing college was not well received at that time so there were a lot of difficult uh, times when uh, there were a lot of disagreements about whether one should spend time in the stock market whether it was a place to even uh, be in uh, during those times uh, i think uh, my mother always supported me and also there was this question of what can an engineer do in the stock market you are not even a chartered accountant you have no knowledge of uh, formal knowledge of accounting you have not uh, trained or schooled with anyone uh, and how are you going to really uh, you know get some benefits out of spending so much time in the stock market uh, these were all questions that were thrown at me and uh, i think at that time my mother support really helped me because uh, she did not question uh, what i tried or what i did and uh, she was the only person who kind of you know supported me by uh, not doubting my ability i think that's a very important uh, part of uh, one's learning and evolution uh, that uh, you should have people around you who don't doubt your ability and or who believe in your uh, uh, persistence right so these are two things which are very very critical and i think my mother played uh, that role my father's role was somewhat different he was the type who would challenge you right uh, my mother would jokingly say that your father always competes with you in everything you do so i mean i didn't see it that way but it was a jokingly reference but my father would always challenge like uh, he would always want us to stretch ourselves and always be uh, something which he has in mind uh, if it's punctuality it has to be in a particular way if it is making choices it has to be in a particular way these are all professional so my what i learned from my father was more on the professional side of how uh, you you be at it you know you don't worry about the outcomes and uh, there have been uh, years my father would have spent uh, doing such things which uh, you know got accepted much later so during those years i now wonder how he would have spent his time because it's difficult that you have a product you have ideas but society is not ready for them right so that is something which i think i learned alongside my father and uh, even the fact that i learned it from him i realized much later actually so that is something which i learned from my father and my father was also uh, very open to trying new things like he would throw himself at challenges uh, that is something which i think uh, i probably got from him my mother was not the type who throws a silver challenges but my father was the type who would uh, explore like uh, like we did the uh, uh, farming together in the sense neither of us have any experience in farming but we we did a lot of innovative things in farming so we threw ourselves out that and that's something i learned alongside my father like he was the main person doing many things and i was more like a supporting actor but now of course i i have to do it myself he is not around so a lot of things that you take from your parents stay with you and uh, the interesting part is you realize it uh, very late actually you don't realize it when you learn so it's something that comes to you much later i'm sure i think that's what connecting the dots is all about right uh, a lot of us uh, especially after we achieve success in life and we become very good at something right uh, uh, there is a tendency sometimes to get that ego in front of us which tells us that we've been a, or we become a self made person where there've been so many people working all throughout our lives to make us what we are today so i think uh, 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 with all gratitude to your parents for raising a son like you a child like you and uh, the the world at large is much better because of people like you so thanks to them and thanks to you sham uh, the second point which i noticed from your 
uh answer was how the times have changed as far as stock markets are looked upon right uh, in those days i think it was more looked upon as a place for gambling trading now a lot of most people are actually gambling and trading but it's looked upon right so when someone is in the stock market people think okay must be a very wise person who's <laughs> who's trading in the stock market said right? all around that but yeah uh, you've seen all that i'm sure uh, and i have a lot of questions about from your experience of 35 years on investing and and growing up as an investor uh my second question is about uh, from parents so i am sure uh, since our last discussion almost 9 years back where you mentioned about getting the right kind of mentors earlier on it and and you mentioned that it was such a key reason uh, that you got into long term investing per se now how important a role has such mentorship played in your life uh, over the last 30 35 years and what are some of the biggest lessons you have learned from your mentors that you may not have learned on your own at that point in your career so that's the first part of the question on mentorship and the second i'll just add what do you advise investors listening to our conversation to do get to to do to get the right kind of mentors in their lives because i think their roles are 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 uh, uh, not really uh, so well thought about but i think the role of mentors is so high in our lives firstly i think mentorship is not outcome based that's the fundamental thing about mentorship you don't go to somebody thinking that in 3 years 4 years they will turn you into something and send you out into the real world uh, i think that's a very unrealistic expectation uh, such mentorships usually don't work um, even somebody can claim that they have been mentored by a or b but uh, if you really go deeper and look whether they carry any other values of these mentors or whether they actually are reflecting something from that other personality you will not find much so the reason that happens is because uh, somebody has decided that they will spend some time with some, another person call him a mentor and then come out and say that i learned this from him i think this doesn't work mentorship should not be outcome based and the mentorship need not even be discipline based for example if you want to be an investor you don't have to only look at investors as your mentors i would think that uh, people from other walks of life entrepreneurs educationists uh, people who work for social good uh, people who are in the business of uh, you know validating things like uh, somebody who ratifies maybe an accountant or an auditor somebody who is uh, uh, into you know giving certification in some act of uh, work it could be from multiple areas where people have uh, experiences right you learn different things from different people i don't think that uh, you have to go to somebody and say teach me all the investing you know and i am going to go back and practice it it doesn't work that way because personalities are different whatever you take from your mentors you have to adapt to your own personality and you have to make it useful to yourself that responsibility is entirely with the mentee it's not with the mentor that is my first point that i want to make while on the subject i must say i am very lucky because i have met multiple people who have uh, played that role in my life um, right from school i have had people uh, who have mentored me on different different things like i was a very shy person i was very scared to go and stand in front of 10 people and speak so the first person who gave me the confidence to speak actually made me speak in the vernacular which i had never spoken below and i went and stood before my class or whatever and my mouth went dry i couldn't speak right on that day i should have logically lost the confidence to speak forever and said i am not going to do this again but thanks to his support to this day i can speak in the vernacular i am able to do a lot of things and i today a public speaker in vernacular i learned that very very early and without a mentor i probably would not have progressed far because i was not naturally made for it because he made me believe that i could do it likewise in multiple areas i have had people who have guided me a lot of them are actually people who are in business because i have learned a lot of business only from business people i have not learned it from investors i have learned it from business people and that is why the way i look at businesses is from a business perspective and not from a investors perspective first and only if i am convinced from the business perspective then i wear the investors hat so a lot of my mentors have been 
business people and they have taught their experiences and that experiences has given me a certain thought process of how to look at business there is another belief that uh, you learn only from people who are successful i have a very different view there have been many people who have not been so successful in life who have actually taught me many things about their life by opening up into their past experiences and honestly sharing their thought processes i think these things have taught me so much because uh, but for them i would not have understood the genesis of failure it's very easy to only look at success but you have to understand failure first so there are many many people who have been generous in teaching us things uh, which would otherwise not be taught by anyone and learning those things uh, from others is very very critical because if you have to learn it on your own then the costs are very very high i think uh, learning from the experience of others is uh, something which you are blessed to do if you have mentors that's right i think uh, someone rightly said that it's only when the student is ready that the teacher appears right so i think your point also validates the same idea that you have to be a student throughout your life whether it's investing or business or or just living a good life and and the right kind of teachers are going to appear in front of you i had, I had a connecting question with that uh, which was about asking you for an alternative for someone who does not have access to such circle of mentors Uh, uh which i think most people listening to our conversation today would fit into but i think your point about just being open to learning right i think i think not just looking at learning investing from investors but also from business owners also from people in a normal day of life of your life right? i think just just being open to learn i think and you'll have enough mentors for you who can guide you in the right path the right way so i think that that answer comes from there so thank you uh you mentioned uh, and as i also understand that getting into the world of investing was not by design for you right uh, uh like like what a lot of people say today that they have always dreamt of becoming an investor but you you've stayed at this game for almost 35 years now uh, and still going strong now my question is what has kept you in this game and what are some of the most important lessons you have learned playing this game of investing over these 3 and a half decades i think this has to do with my uh belief in rigor because uh i always do something which i take up with full involvement i don't uh, you know do it for the sake of an outcome or anything like that once i decide to do something i give my everything and uh, i also like to do it in a certain disciplined way all these things come from the people i have observed in my life in my family one of the and outside of family i would name one of the most iconic personalities from whom i have learned Uh, this thing of doing what you like with full energy no matter what mr elai raja was a prolific musician i have seen him from the age of uh, 12 or 13 every morning i would see him at 6:45 going to work and you know i would wonder what motivates this man to run like this and i have seen him work in the studios i have seen how how prolific he was and i really like the way somebody applies and gives us everything to what he does and that is something uh, which i have uh, enjoyed doing and i started enjoying it very early no matter what the outcome and over a period of time uh, when you do something for years together you enjoy it so much that you don't really want to be away from it uh, i think that trait if you develop early in life then you don't feel like you're working so you you keep doing what you are doing that's it there's no you don't question yourself that uh, am i doing it right am i doing it better than another person should i be better than what others think i am or uh, am i uh, the best in what i do you don't worry about all these things you only think about the fact that you enjoy doing it the most you don't enjoy doing anything else better and that's what gives you happiness it's as simple as that sure i think uh, as i also briefly understand there are two kind of kinds of games that we play in life you have finite games and you have infinite games right so finite games by as the name suggests they have an ending right they are finite like a sports competition or a, or a chess competition or a football competition right uh, uh infinite games are games where there's no ending there are no winners there are no losers they only players so i think just being obsessed like you said right the rigor is what keeps you going i think just being 
and i'm sure uh, that's what i've seen you the last 10 years up i'm sure you've been the same kind of person the last 35 years as well the rigors uh, and the idea of just playing the game for the sake of playing because you enjoy playing this game i think rather than trying to win over someone or uh, try to avoid losing i think that is what i think has kept you in the game and so many people i've known who who really done well at at their work at their task uh, for for decades i think it's largely the rigor which is the right word that you mentioned uh, the obsession with playing the game and not trying to win it so that's a wonderful lesson uh, uh, if if you you've outlined a lot of lessons in your in, through your tweets and through your podcast and everything but if you were to name just three most critical lessons that you've learned through your mentors through your own practice uh, over the last 3 uh, and a half decades in investing right or investment decision making just three most critical lessons that you would want to advise to young investors new investors what would they be the first one is don't compare i think each person is unique each person has his own way of thinking and each person has his own path to success so i think one should take that path and go towards their destination so you should not compare that's the first point and second don't be just outcome driven i think a lot of people particularly now in this 3 years i see have become increasingly outcome driven and obsessed and if you want to do this for a long period of time you will have different types of outcomes and you have to weather the bad outcomes to live to enjoy the great outcomes so if you only want great outcomes then you will not be ready to face the bad outcomes so that's the second point i think you should not be uh, outcome driven and the third most important develop your own style i think it's very very important to be individualistic in what you do you you should have something which is unique to yourself because then you have an identity which you can grow if you are only going to borrow from others then you don't have an identity if they don't grow you don't grow if they degrow you also degrow so i think that having that individualistic persona is very very important so these are the three things that i would think are very very important uh in the in the initial years of our investing journey sham so our long term goals uh, largely revolve around money investing and becoming financially secure however uh, as we gain financial independence our goals also evolve when we realize that when we are young we are in hurry to meet our goals but later on realize that the direction is more important than speed i wrote about uh, recently a house slowing down the pace in life and investing and instead getting our directions right is of such a great importance for each individual each investor out there how has finding your own direction become a compass in your life's journey and what advice can you offer to those who are still searching for their own paths whether in investing or outside of it so i think i have been very fortunate in that uh, i was guided in my early years to think for myself to work hard for my own direction and to stick to certain beliefs and certain values so i would avoid directions which would get me into trouble or i would be mentored at each point in time in my life not to go in certain directions so the amount of time i have lost going in the wrong direction has been much less in my life and i think i am purely blessed by that and i don't think it is my virtue really it is just the uh, luck and the good fortune of having people who help me in this what happens when you don't go in the wrong direction is that you spend more time in the right direction we all measure outcome what is the return you made for so many years what are the best investments you made how did they fare all these things we go into all these metrics but the core factor behind success in each of these metrics is spending most of your time in the right direction there will always be a little time when you go in the wrong direction but if you spend most of your time in the right direction let's say you spend 80 90% of your time in the right direction the 10 or 20% won't even matter so in that sense i have been very blessed to have spent most of the time in the 
right direction. So I have not really had the problem of going in the wrong direction. For example, when I look back, I think why did I never buy or believe in those big larger than life operators who are involved in multiple scams? Because the whole market is going behind them. Right? It happened in 92, it happened in 2000, it happened in 2008, it will happen again. Why do I always not go in that direction? Why do I always go in the other direction? And why do I not chase uh, some big uh, boom in a theme like the tech boom of 2000? Why do I not chase infra? So I always stay away from these kind of places, right? And I always try to find what I believe in, what suits my uh, thought process, my personality, uh, my values and I try to invest in such places. It is always possible that I lose my way once or twice but most of the time I think that I have not had the misfortune of going in the wrong direction which I think is a great blessing. I think that's such an important advice of not just uh, choosing the right direction where you want to walk into but also knowing what directions can kill you and you don't take that path so automatically over time if you give enough time I think you will find your path so that's a wonderful lesson. I was, I was listening to your CFA talk, and I think uh, that's one talk which I uh, uh, would recommend to uh, everyone who's watching our conversation today to go and watch. The Sham talks about his experience of three plus decades in around NR and gives his his uh, journey as an investor. And there's so many lessons that you can take out from there. Uh, uh, I, I I personally got a great deal of learning about your journey as an investor, but the uh, one big lesson I left with uh, was when you advised young listeners in the audience to grow themselves ahead of their portfolios. Uh, now, people all around and even with no experience with dealing with market cycles, I've, I think, made a lot of money the last two to three years. But your advice is that when you make a lot of money ahead of when you should make it, it is your duty to grow yourself first and then handle that money. You said, and I, and I quote, don't think that success is your birthright and by virtue of your success, you have already grown. Your money has grown faster than it should have grown, which does not mean that you have grown. So you should always grow yourself ahead of your portfolio. Quotes closed. This is very insightful, Sham, especially in today's world when making money seems to have gotten so easy and people may be forgetting the virtues of dedicated hard work to achieve wealth and success. Tell me more about your thoughts on this, about the importance of growing ourselves ahead of our portfolios and how can one do that? So this is something which I have not told others. This is something that I have told myself earlier, which I just expressed to others. So it's a very autobiographical statement. You can take it on face value. The point is that the markets which punish us for some duration of time, then rewards us disproportionately, right? If you're able to weather the punishment and if you're able to pass through that phase of uh, punishment when the markets are not recognizing uh, all your investment thinking, all your choices, then the next phase is going to reward you far more than the markets punished you. Right? The reward which a market gives is actually for bearing the punishment with conviction. That's all. This is what happens to us cycle after cycle. But there are a lot of people who have not experienced the punishment itself. They have only seen the reward side. And one is always lucky to start like that in the market. And when you are young, it's like beginner's luck. You are able to start in such a phase when you are only seeing the brighter side of investing. Then it is very natural for people to get carried away. And I have seen this multiple times uh, and whenever I see it I tell myself that I should not get uh, carried away by the recent successes in an investment because uh, the duty which I have to myself is to prepare myself for bigger things because otherwise I would never be able to handle them. Whether it was handling a portfolio of a few lakhs or handling whatever I am handling today which is uh, you know, something uh, which I have not ever imagined at the time I came to the market. I have always had the same thought process that I need to become better because if I am successful, 
then I would not know how to handle it. So it's something that I have constantly told myself along this journey. And I also tell the people around me that uh, if you have done well in a year, uh, then the next year is going to be very difficult because we need to be far more prepared for the next year than we were prepared for this success. So we need to grow ourselves constantly. And actually, that's the brightest side of this field because every year you are trying to become better at what you do or you are trying to avoid that degeneration and you are trying to create some strengths for yourself and you are always trying to find it around you which leads you on to learning, meeting new people, um, acquiring new skills, improving your behavior. All these things have to happen. And only these things will help you handle success. Without these things, I think people will get success but may not be able to sustain or retain it. That's my experience which I have said there. I have not uh, said anything uh, which I don't believe in because this is something I tell myself all the time. I think uh, that's such an important insight as well, like drumming the idea of not... uh or drumming the idea of keeping your ego in check and always being a learning machine uh, rather than looking, as you mentioned, rather than being outcome dependent and thinking that it was your skill only that took you so far. I'm sure it's also a matter of huge amount of luck and the willingness and the openness to keep learning that really takes someone really far in investing or otherwise. Uh, So that's a great lesson, Sham. Another key insight uh, you shared in your talk was about your general tendency over the years to stay away from the frothy sections of the market or where there is uh, too much excitement. Like you stayed away from the dot-com boom, then the 2008 power infrastructure boom. Then in 2008, small caps boom, where you said you were trying to get out of hot stocks, then getting in. You've said that this tendency has helped you survive your 35 years in the market. But I understand that apart from the right kind of mentorship, this may have required tremendous amount of self-control and the ability to look beyond what's hot and over the long run, even giving up the enticement of near-term riches. How have you developed such a tendency? Were you born with it or you've grown that uh, over a period of time? And what can a new investor just starting out do to develop such a mental wherewithal to stay clear of the noise instead of giving in to the temptations of quick and easy money? No, I think staying out of trouble is a natural tendency that is there with you. Like if you're in school, you won't hang out with a British pack, which will go and do all sorts of things, you know, who will paint the town red. Uh, you won't get into trouble, right? It's a natural tendency that's part of our personality. But relative to the stock market, it has a slightly more important uh, relevance. That is, I come to the stock market uh, after a lot of opposition. There was a lot of opposition to my coming to the stock market. And in the very first cycle, when I faced the uh, liberalization upside and the Harshad Mehta event, The only thing in my mind was that I should not be forced to leave what I was doing. I had to stay in that game. So if I had to do that, then I should always stay out of trouble. So wherever I was looking at trouble emerging, I would, uh, you know, move away from that place. For example, if I saw uh, somebody was manipulating a particular stock and taking it up, I would sell it and go away or I would not go anywhere near it to buy it. One of the two things. If I already owned it, I would sell it and go away. If I did not own it, I would avoid buying it. Whereas the natural tendency of most people at the time was to buy what is being manipulated because it would go up and they would make money. But I didn't do it because I didn't want to lose finally. I saw the final outcome and I said, I don't want that outcome. Therefore, I'll stay away from it. It was just sheer sustenance And, you know, I wanted to stay in the game and that is what first shaped my thinking in the investment world. Add to that the natural tendency where I don't want to go into places where there would be trouble. You know, the famous saying which we uh, keep going back, tell me where I'm going to die and I will not go there. My thinking is, tell me where there's going to be a lot of manipulation and trouble. I don't want to go there because I don't want the consequence of that. It's as simple as that. I think that idea of staying in the game and surviving uh, being the most prominent ideas in investing if you really want to compound your wealth over a long period of time is such an an important idea rather than just trying to 
compound initially, right? And not really worrying about whether you'll be able to stay in the game uh, through the thick and thin as well. So I think that's a very relevant and very important lesson, uh, especially for young investors who started post-2020, very new, inexperienced, but have seen a lot of riches and a lot of wealth creation in the markets, thinking that uh, this is what market is all about. But as uh, uh, we've learned over 20, 30, 40 years of staying in the market, it's is that it's a great humiliator, right? The moment you start thinking that you've learned it all, you made it all in life and investing, you, you brought down to earth, right? So uh, uh, given all this and knowing that this is how the cycles work of market and life, right? I think the, the, the idea of just doing those things and avoiding those things that so that you can stay in the game, I think that's such a important, relevant example. And you've, you've been an example of that. So uh, great. Uh, you, you've, been three, you've been through uh, more than three decades, so three full decades in investing. Uh, which has been that decade so far that when you look back has handed you your biggest challenges and also the most important learnings? I'm sure every decade must have a story to tell. But if you were to pick out which of these decades have been the biggest challenge, most challenging and has lent the most lessons to you and why? I think uh, every decade has its challenges. The first decade was very challenging because I had no income, you have no capital, uh, and you have to generate your income also from the market. And the market was flat or sideways for very, very long years. People would not be even willing to believe that we had a market where four or five years, it was uh, very difficult to make any returns, right? So we've had such phases in the first decade of my investing because after the Harshad Mehta crash, it took a very, very long time for people to come back to equity markets. It's not like the present where people buy every dip, every second day. Uh, it's not like that. People uh, did not bother about uh, any uh, correction or dip. People just wanted to be away from equity. So that was a very difficult phase because my financial situation was also uh, not uh, you know, something great to write home about because you have to sustain yourself or whatever you do. You have to sustain yourself only from the income from the market. Uh, that was very difficult. I think that was the toughest. Once I crossed that stage where uh, I had, I, I, I could sustain myself uh, without uh, much trouble, then it became much better, I would say. The, though the subsequent decades, I also had their fair share of challenges. Uh, but the first one was the toughest. And I think for most investors, the first decade will be the toughest one. I think you also mentioned that uh, the period of COVID also was a tough period for you, uh, uh, family, personal reasons, health reasons, and of course, uh, the general uh, situation in the market, investing and everything. And, and you also mentioned that you were not really thinking much about investing at that point of time, unlike most people who thought that as yes, an opportunity. Yes, that is true. Uh, that is true. Because uh, in the previous uh, 27 years, uh, no, 30 years, I had not thought about what would happen uh, if something suddenly uh, you know, takes me away from this world. I had not thought about that because you are just enjoying the journey and not thinking about something as drastic as this. Because if you are in reasonable health and you are not stressed, you know that this is not a discipline that is going to, you know, take your life away unless there is an accident or something like that. But uh, COVID opened uh, up a possibility of uh, something totally unconnected to your actions, uh, snuffing you out, right? I had uh, seen uh, a couple of friends, uh, you know, leave this world suddenly. Like, you know, uh, a family friend uh, lost two generations. And while uh, uh, performing the rights for these two generations, uh, he contracted COVID and he also he also lost his life. So we, when you hear these kind of stories, it's very distressing. It's very, very distressing to see such uh, uh, loss of life uh, and it happened so uh, fast and uh, it looked like there was no way in which it could be stopped you know it was a very disconcerting uh, phase so that phase uh, did not allow me to think about uh, how to you know quickly create a trade or buy something that goes up or uh, look for momentum or chart or whatever i i, I was wondering what I should do to secure whatever I had done till then. It took me a long time to recover from that uh, thought process. It clearly took me the entire first wave and uh, a good part of the second wave. Also, I had just created a PMS product which we had just completed investing uh, 
days after we completed our investing uh, covid struck and we barely had uh, any customers very small number of customers and uh, we had our obligation to them a lot of things were hanging so i was more worried about those things than about my personal investing at that point in time plus we had older people to take care of they had their health issues somebody was shooting fever we didn't know why it was happening a lot of things happening around me definitely had an influence on me during that phase i talked to a lot of people and again uh, uh, from an investing point of view investing community right who who regret not investing at that point of time i think my point is that uh, we should rather be grateful that we survived that time right? exactly so, i am in your camp i have no regret <laughs> and uh, i felt that i was uh, more dutiful at that time than uh, being uh, uh, greedy see you are you are only equating greed and fear but i would think that you should also equate greed and duty sometimes you have to do your duty first and not be greedy for what you want to get out of that time that was a time when we had to do our duty to anybody around us and uh, either professionally or personally it is not the time to actually be greedy that is how my mental makeup is and i think that was the right thing to do i have no regret that's right all i've heard from you over the past 40 minutes of a conversation sham is makes me so amply clear and uh, uh, though i've even known you for the last 10 years that you're so internally aligned right which is which is again uh, uh, without saying without saying it's such a very important uh, character attribute to have rather than uh, uh, extrinsically aligned or just only thinking about greed and thinking about money and outcomes and everything you one needs to be uh uh internally aligned to be able to live through the vicissitudes of life right whatever life whatever life brings to you whether in markets investing real life family i think uh, the only way you cannot be prepared for that right you only need to you need to be that kind of a person because there are so many so many times life uh, life throws us uh, things which are just outside the syllabus right outside the playbook and correct uh, covid was one an event so you cannot be prepared for an event you have to be just prepared for dealing with anything that comes you so the idea of margin of safety the idea of uh, not being outcome dependent the idea of keeping your ego in check i think they all all and the idea i think the wonderful idea that you mentioned about greed and duty right instead of just greed and fear i think these are such insightful lessons uh, 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 you mentioned i think uh, uh, with respect to investing about covid you mentioned that uh, one of the changes in mindset that you had uh, during that time was uh, because you started link- thinking even long term right uh you said you shifted your investment horizon from 5 plus years to 10 plus years now. now 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 what changed that mindset of course the idea of mortality the idea of thinking taking even a long term or longer term perspective is what i understand but what went through your mind when you were thinking even or started to think even longer term with your investment it's very simple it comes from the past experience because at such a phase in your life when you are having a crisis all around you start thinking of what could you have done better and the first thing that came to my mind was i could have taken decisions which have a higher shelf life where you don't have to replace a decision with another decision if you have bought something which you can hold for forever ideally then that's the best decision whereas if you have bought something that goes up very fast and then you have to change it again in 3 or 4 years with another decision which is at least as good if not better then you are actually setting yourself up for more decisions and when you see the kind of uh, crisis that comes something like a covid then you think how can i make my decisions fewer how can i make a decision today which will last longer so that i don't have to keep making decisions also look at it this way if i made a decision and if i am not around let's say you know i am not i am less fortunate and lose my life then the people who inherit the portfolio don't have to make decision they can just stay with the decision any investor i would say i would say any investor who has a large responsibility a significant portfolio or large responsibility of uh, you know investment management should actually orient himself to save the people for whom he is investing right and i wanted to definitely 
do whatever it takes to ensure that their investments have the capability to deliver the outcome and also the longevity so the only way i could think of doing this better was by increasing the investment horizon when i increase the investment horizon then the my then my quality of choices had to naturally improve so i set a rule by which a lot of choices got naturally eliminated right right i think uh, that reminds me of what i think peter bernstein said that your wealth is like your children right it's not just about uh, seeking a promising future you also have the responsibility of handling them well and raising them well which is so true of wealth as well you have such a great responsibility of treating your wealth uh, now uh, uh, in in a very uh, nice manner uh, so that it also has a promising future but you cannot really expect the second and not do the first right so that's also, great lesson. i want uh, to tell you something that yeah. struck me uh, during that uh, crisis about the previous decade because the decade before 2020 was uh, my best decade till then so when i look back at what really worked then i understood that all the things that worked very well for me in that decade i had worked a lot in the previous decade so the homework in each idea was multi cyclical i worked for a team in one company for one cycle that company got sold early right but the same learning i am able to take into another company in the subsequent cycles so the ideation itself is not the time i have seen this particular company it comes from the previous thing previous experience so broadly i would have worked 5 6 years on the idea without realizing i worked 5 6 years and then i invest and then over the next 5 6 years the stock had performed exceptionally well so the cycle was actually 10 years so even today if i see all the positions that i am building i had studied something in 2008 while studying steel that learning i am using in 2018 it's 2024 my investment is 5 years old but the process if you look at is not 5 years old it is 15 years old to use what you have learned it takes so much time so these are the areas where i have been successful so i don't want to do something where i pick up an industry today and then translate it into a decision tomorrow like a ems an industry that has just formed i am not interested in going into that because it needs far more validation unless i am able to intensely do that work or i have somebody who is able to you know crunch all this into an investment hypothesis in the shortest possible time i would not want to go into that at all so i want to do things over a longer period because to me that is a sure shot way of creating a better investment experience for myself or those whom i am investing for right i i remember uh, my interaction with vinod sethi in a previous episode where he actually said the same thing like you're saying right when uh, a lot of us uh, as analysts and investors we the moment we finish our analysis we are ready to act right uh, but uh, the lesson that he left me with that time which i think uh, uh, i so well relate to uh, since you're talking that about today again is that uh, uh, once we've done our homework uh, once we've done the hard work of finding businesses and analyzing businesses and industry right we should and and this is the term that he used we should let the market whisper whisper in our ears when is the right time to buy which is the valuation right or whichever that by the time that you are really convinced about the idea that you're working on instead of simply finishing your analysis and instantly acting which is which may not be the right time to act right so it it has taken you multiple years to finally act after doing multiple years of hard work i think that's a, such a great important lesson i think he's very right uh you should not compel yourself into investment action the idea should compel you into action i think i agree with him entirely on this uh, because only such ideas uh, generate the kind of outcomes that uh, give us uh, uh, very gratifying experiences when you rush yourself it is not uh, the right way it's uh, it's rehearsed and i think that uh, you have to allow the idea to come to you 
and hit you and uh, you should not go and hit on ideas it's as simple as that just briefly uh, uh, since you're talking about long term horizons right uh, uh, if i were to uh, ask you a question about your quick checklist for identifying great businesses that you can aim to hold on for 10 years what are those two or three or four or five things that you're going to look at for such longevity so i think the business should not be easily replaceable you can't have uh, something else suddenly coming and saying that now you don't need this because something new has come up i think uh, any business which is not easily replaceable uh, should be good to look at beyond that it should be a business which is a very good allocator of capital which doesn't require capital and it should be run by a management which is a good allocator of capital you can have a business which doesn't require capital but you can have a management which will not give the capital to the shareholder so if these three things align just three simple things if they align then it's a question of doing your math and getting it at a valuation most favorable to you and if you get it then you're set you can just travel with it you you talked about allocation uh, capital allocation for management but overall uh, talk uh, beyond business so we talked about briefly about uh, the three or four things that you look at in a business uh, for you to uh, make a, a mark for your 10 year plus investment horizon how do you broadly think about company management apart from capital allocation or including capital allocation so two questions how do you think about company's management from a long term perspective and also how do you think about valuations from a long term perspective see when you look at a management you have to see how they are forming their board what kind of independent directors they are keeping what kind of audit firms they are employing what is the quality of the management discussion they are holding with shareholders how they choose to disclose more than is mandatory how they engage with all stakeholders there are some managements who will talk only to a few people and not to all people such managements which do selective disclosure to shareholders are probably less trustworthy in my opinion whereas some managements tell everything uh, in the presentation itself so even if i am a shareholder who has no access to even attend a con call by reading the presentation i will know everything about the business so managements which uh, respect all stakeholders should be given the highest ranking that is the first point and managements which selectively respect shareholders should be given the lowest ranking that's how i will differentiate and as i mentioned to you how they form their board how they run conduct uh, their uh, company how they run the audit committee how they run the compensation committee all these things are all there for us to see if you if you look closer you will be able to see these things very clearly yes there could be some managements with whom you don't even have to worry about this you are very blessed if you have such managements but generally you need to have a look at how they run the business and the evidence is there all around us and i would like managements to disclose more than shareholders demand then such managements uh, are ensuring that investors know what they must expect i think that is something which i would definitely want from a management because i want to stay long what about valuation so uh, what's your mental framework of looking at valuations without any number or any formula but how do you look at valuations see it's very subjective i will tell you but in 1990 and 2000 a small cap was deemed to be expensive if it was more than 5p probably 2000 2010 it moved to 10p 2010 to 20 it moved to 20 and now i don't know where it's moving honestly i think uh, valuation to my mind is a function of liquidity and how central bankers are managing the world and i think that when central bankers are going to face a crisis then i would tighten my valuation framework i'd be more careful and uh, i would always not attribute valuation to managements i would attribute it to the macros and to the way economies are being managed as far as what we should pay under normal circumstances i would always want to pay less than what the market is paying how is it possible it's not easy because you are having a over researched market it would mean that i would always go into companies 
where the market is not seeing one or two years down the road because market has this bias of recency and it wants to get things faster so if i am willing to wait two or three years itself my options increase that's the only way i am able to manage valuations in the current environment and if i look at what has happened in the last 10 years also wherever i have been successful it is only where i have been able to leave at least one year's earnings to the market and then after that be right on the company you you mentioned about central bankers uh, in uh, so i was talking to naren of icici prudential amc some months back who's also one of your good friends in in one of the previous episodes where he mentioned how over the next 10 years global central bankers who have played a key role in the asset price inflation globally through the easy money policies since 2008 they will make a mistake and the equity fund managers he said would have to take the blame now i do not want you to go deeper into this but from your perch and based on your long experience in the markets how do you see the market and business cycles over the years have have a politicians and central bankers managed to eliminate the so called business cycles so that we have no recessions or stock market downturns ever again actually i would attribute my best investment phase to those two you just mentioned so 2009 to 2012 the indian economy was not managed well and central bankers got the call wrong on inflation interest rates and currency all three which created that bear market between 2011 and uh, 2013 but for that bear market i would never have made the returns which i made in the subsequent decade post 2020 post the covid crisis the rally we are seeing today in stocks is entirely a creation of central banks maybe india was relatively more responsible than the rest of the world but in a connected world it's porous right the, the impact is definitely going to move very fast from one corner of the world to another so i think that a lot of equity valuation is attributable to how central banks behave long bear markets also have relevance to how central banks fail to manage inflation why are we not having a bear market now in the us there are no easy answers but that question remains i don't think that you can push that question aside and move on because some day the question will come back to haunt us you you've talked uh, earlier about investing in a travel company just before covid hit and then going through the struggles of keeping it afloat through those bad times and uh, 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 fortunately it is doing well now now apart from your investing hat uh, you've also won the hat of an entrepreneur uh, tell me the most critical lessons that entrepreneurship has taught you that has helped you in your investing and also a couple of maybe investing lessons that have helped you in your entrepreneurship i have remained an entrepreneur throughout my career thanks to my mentor who took a promise from me that i should never stop being an entrepreneur so i was in manufacturing for 22 years and i am in service for the rest of my uh, entire investing life the key thing about entrepreneurship is it teaches you patience uh, investors are not as patient as entrepreneurs but if your core is entrepreneurial you are able to bring a lot more patience to your investing that's the first point um, investors live quarter to quarter Entre- entrepreneurs cannot live quarter to quarter which is why you are seeing so much of problem in the venture capital world and other places where investors set the agenda for entrepreneurs right so the entrepreneurial agenda has much longer duration it has longevity also and uh, it is something which has got a ma- more multi dimensional and multi disciplinary approach than investing i know a lot of investors use multidisciplinary approach uh, you know while speaking but in practice i think the dimension of return dominates multiple other dimensions whereas for an entrepreneur uh, he doesn't run his business just for roi there are multiple factors which is running a business for, for which motivate him so i think that basically definitely helps me because i i don't wear the hat of an investor alone so for example you mentioned the, the travel startups uh, i was also invested in a very 
important listed travel company. So it was a double whammy for me, effectively. So on both sides. Uh, but uh, I was confident that if you give time, compounding will come back. And uh, now I am confident that if you give more time, compounding will only get better. So if I did not have an entrepreneurial mindset, I would have sold out as soon as I recovered my cost. I would have said, thank God, now I'm out. Right? And uh, it's only because I'm seeing myself as part of the business. I think like an owner, I'm able to stay longer. And I think I'm able to think like an owner only because I have been an entrepreneur and owner of something all my life. So if I'm building a business today, I'm not thinking of how to sell it. I don't think that's the right way to build a business. And I don't do it with my present company because I never did it with my earlier company, which I ran for 22 years. So this concept of selling out or building for sale is anathema to me as an entrepreneur. And it is now up to me to take that same spirit into my investing and not separate them. So at least I should take this spirit into my investing and try to own businesses longer. That is broadly the thought process. And I think being an entrepreneur taught me this. And thankfully, I didn't give myself the choice of saying that enough of entrepreneurship, only investing, which a lot of people have given. I'm not judging them. But for me, this is what works. I think it's so important to have that right philosophy, whether you're a business owner or an investor, if you really want to uh, 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 play that long game uh, over 10 years, 15, 20 years, much beyond what most people would like to play, right? So uh, you've also stressed upon the importance of uh, having an investment philosophy for every investor. Uh, uh, I would, I would like you to elaborate more on that point about investment philosophy because a lot of people listening today may, may be very young, not, not having an investment philosophy and investing just uh, with the flow of things because others are doing it. Right? So tell me more about this idea of the importance of having an investment philosophy and about the, the most important ingredients that a new investor can use to create a sound investment philosophy of their own. See, I think a lot of our investment philosophies is imbibed from investors whom we have observed. I think there's a lot of borrowing, if I may say so, at a philosophy level. Because when we learn about what somebody has done, we like a lot of it. Like I like the idea of making fewer decisions. Because I have made multiple decisions and I've learned that it's better if I make fewer decisions. And there are people who have been there before. So you learn and crystallize something in your mind. I prefer investing in businesses which are simple, easy to understand, easy to measure, and easy to own. It's as simple as that. If you are able to find such companies, then those companies are likely to fit more with my philosophy. That's how I view it. If I'm able to find such companies, I'm more comfortable with them. Whereas Complexity is something that I believe I am not well equipped to handle well or handle better. I prefer managements who are very self-aware on their capital allocation. I prefer managements who also have a certain rigor in capital allocation. I'll explain. If you see the Two groups in South which have done very well for shareholders. One is the TVS group and the other is the Murugappa group. The real takeoff for these two groups happened after their payout policy was crystallized in companies. Incidentally, the government nudged it by making dividend tax-free in the hands of shareholders. I don't know what would have happened if this didn't happen. I attribute a lot to that policy, but still... I'm glad it happened. Now, when that happened, owning those businesses became easier for investors for much longer durations. The cyclicality of the business actually didn't matter. 
so by making it a part of your investment philosophy to buy only companies who have a good dividend policy you are actually insulating yourself from a lot of managements who are very whimsical on capital allocation so in your philosophy you need elements like this each person can have his own investment philosophy but you need to have definitive elements which protect you as an investor which also do good to the business and which are able to create the right investment culture in the companies which will propel growth for a very long period of time so there are companies which don't need the money like uh, lever and who pay it out like a nestle or a hindustan lever but itc could have been that company but it chose to enter businesses just to you know keep the capital within and pay out less for whatever reasons it could be something related to their own shareholding structures and things like that right so the market will always recognize one over the other and you see when itc paid out 100% dividend and said that we will follow a certain policy with respect to dividend it changed so if your investment philosophy was to identify this trait then you would not have had those difficult years with itc and when you saw the change you would have spotted it very easily if so many people fail to do that it's because in their investment philosophy this clarity is not adequate and and i think more about that as well uh, 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 you you've mentioned the uh, the importance of time right which i think is a real differentiator in investing and the journey of compounding you you talked you talked about you just talked about the idea of not thinking about selling because you're thinking of yourself as an owner a long term owner of high quality compounding businesses right so people worry about a lot about investment ideation you mentioned uh, stock ideas they finding they want to find their own investment techniques right which we which we've also mentioned that they are much simpler things to do in investing but i think the most difficult thing to do in investing or practice in investing is to uh, focus on time right uh, which means focus on not doing uh, a lot of things or sometimes doing nothing right when nothing must be done uh, so my question around this is what what according to you makes focusing on time uh, or focusing on the long term compounding so difficult as a practice uh, uh, we can only teach people about the importance of compounding and people know about that right people know that time is the most important variable in the compounding formula but how do you teach someone so what has been your experience of teaching someone uh, about the importance of time and how do you build patience the patience muscle right uh, is it is it like something that you're born with or you can develop and how do you do that i think the problems we have with time are related to our need for activity everyone wants activity and you want new activity and you want to relate that activity to your own relevance let's say you're owning a company for 25 years that capital would not be available to invest in any other company let's say you're owning five stocks for the last 25 years then you would have not participated in any of the fads you would have still made money most people sell businesses to buy new things to participate in the fads because you want to be seen as doing something you want to be seen as having enough activity now this is a problem always let me flip it and ask you a question go back and take your portfolio of 2000 or 2010 take your excel put today stock prices and see your net worth and see your current portfolio and compare yourself quite often you realize that lot of activity which you did probably had no place in your life and i think this will apply to a lot many investors so the real problem is our need for activity and because we need activity we spend less time with investments so we change our choices because we want activity the only way uh, we can do this better is by finding some other activity to keep ourselves busy as investors and uh, allowing your investments to do the job for you 
Yes, I think that's something that uh, you also mentioned when we met the last time somewhere around 2015 in your office, where you mentioned that uh, the best investing happens when you focus a lot of time outside of investing and not on investing. Yes, not I, I am of that view. Right. And uh, you just mentioned that uh, doing that mental exercise of uh, going 20 years back and then putting today's price and seeing that you would have earned much more by not acting at all. I'm sure that same situation is going to happen even if you move 20 years forward from now. where It people, will. At least okay. if we capture that better, you are blessed. That's right. That's right. And people today might be thinking, okay, I, it's all history now. Things have passed. Now the stocks are not available and I need to be hyperactive to do all those kind of things. But every five years, they regret, I, I wish I could have avoided so much activity and just focus on what really mattered. So, and people are doing that with mutual funds as well, not just stocks trading in and out of mutual funds and stopping their SIP. The mutual fund their itself is uh, saying that trading is that our is investment philosophy. I am that is true. At a loss that's of true. words, how so much of hyperactivity can lead us to a better place? The time will tell. That is true. Action equals to achievement. I think that's a mentality. Probably the more you act, the more you think you achieve which is not, I think, a good way. It, it happens in medicine. It happens in investing business everywhere. Yes. Uh, and of course, uh, I think uh, also uh, something to blame apart from the fact that you yourself you, is to blame for too much activity. I think it's a noise all around, right? Uh, early it was just traditional media. Now we have social media. Uh, amidst this, you, I think uh, uh, you've been one of those rare voices of prudence on platforms like Twitter and YouTube where where we see a lot of people with huge followings publicize their holdings, they promote this portfolio of stocks uh, while blurring the lines between financial education and talking up, talking up their stocks. Right? I've loved your tweets and have always wanted to ask you to create a book of your tweets. In fact, I do that publicly today and also offer my help if you plan to ever do that, right? to make a book out of your tweets. I'll certainly take care about that. Yeah. Uh, so I... I I, I read your tweets diligently and I was going through your tweets uh, while preparing for uh, this uh, conversation and found one of them which I would like you to elaborate more upon. Uh, so you wrote and I quote uh, that investing for many has become more about their ego uh, than about their wealth creation. People mix up things so badly that they forget that they are investing for what they are investing for. Success earned in easy times only makes it worse. The ego takes over fully and does not allow reason to even mark its presence. Now, that's not a good place to be in simply because it leads you on to a place where you must never go. It would be good to realize that once you are landed in the wrong place, a comeback is going to take forever. So better late than never. Quotes closed. Now, I know this contains a lot of lessons for new as well as experienced investors because as they say, ego is the enemy. Tell me more about that. See, firstly, I have seen people never talk about their accomplishments. And uh, I've seen how they carried it lightly on their shoulders. And because those accomplishments sit lightly on their shoulders, they are keep accomplishing more. When you start carrying your accomplishments very heavily on yourself and very visibly so in the public media or social media, then you are forced to spend a lot of your time doing heavy lifting with your positions on these accomplishments. Let's say you give a portfolio of uh, 10 stocks and you say that I am the best. Then you have to keep on answering the question whether you are actually the best. Right? You have to. Then you sell one stock, you explain why you sold. You buy another one, you explain why you did. And it becomes one massive ego trip where you are all the time you know, spending all your energy is only on this ego trip. Right? And what do you get in return? I don't know what you get in return. Social media is a place where you can engage with more people than you otherwise would. And it has to be a healthy engagement. So I think that uh, talking about your stocks is something which always leads to something unhealthy. That is my personal experience and my personal opinion. Uh, and it has nothing to do with social media. Even when I was a very small investor and there were gatherings where people would go and boast about the stocks they bought and how their stocks are superior, I would sit and observe only. So very rarely would I uh, talk about companies which I had just bought. And I have maintained that practice right through my 
years i have never felt the need to get peer validation by tom toming an idea i would go to an individual privately and ask his opinion but i won't go into a group and you know do this uh, grandstanding right so that is something which is uh, not natural to me and i am not comfortable with that and i only continue that in social media it has nothing to do with the size of social media or uh, uh, the size of following or anything like that actually speaking if i keep discussing whatever companies i keep buying or selling probably my following will be much more but for what joy i don't understand what i would get out of uh, you know having a larger following because uh, this is not going to give you peace of mind and it is not going to improve your behavior with your investment in the end whatever you do in the public should improve your behavior with your investment you have to handle your investment better by virtue of that you have to handle yourself also better if it is going to lead to something worse i don't see any benefit in doing that and i didn't believe there was a benefit even in the pre social media era which is why i have a very um frosty relationship with uh, television also uh, and uh, actually i have no relationship and uh, i generally avoid all these things because i feel that it doesn't improve my experience with my investment and anything that doesn't improve my relationship with my investments uh, i would like to avoid moving on from a bit of investing to more of life philosophy and this is the uh, this is my bigger purpose with the 1% show is that to uh, uh, seek the ideas from the wisest people i know of uh, to talk not just about compounding in their investing but compounding in their lives the most important things that they have done and avoided doing in their life and how do you how do they look at the the bigger aspects of life think like quantity think like contentment so so my next question is about contentment and uh, in an in an episode of this podcast i talked to swanand kelkar of breakout capital who who left me with a wonderful equation of contentment which uh, he defined as what you have uh, what you have uh, uh, divided by what you want right so i think uh, it it's such an intensely practical formula for living many of us go about our lives desperately trying to increase the numerator which is uh, what we what we have right by working spending working spending and so on and so forth but the hedonic treadmill makes this entire exercise a pure futility because we are never happy we always come down to the steady state of happiness that we were earlier right after a brief moment of too much excitement and happiness and uh, we realize that satisfaction always escapes our grasp whatever we do now the secret uh, as swanand also mentioned is to raise the final value of this equation of contentment by focusing on reducing the denominator which is what you want right so the fewer wants that are screaming inside your brain and dividing your attention the more peace and satisfaction will be left for what you already have what are your thoughts on contentment and despite it being a daily struggle to feel contented how are you trying to achieve it uh, now this is especially given that you are in a investing space where where in the struggle for alpha generation wealth creation contentment is generally very hard to work towards so what's your mantra here see when i work for others it's like a doctor's job i try to ensure that their financial health is satisfactory as simple as it when doctor works for physical health uh, we work for the financial health that is the first point so whatever we do we try to align it towards giving them that happiness on their financial health so that is becoming more and more what gives me contentment for example many people think that you should work only with the people who are very very rich but when i came to work with others i actually started working in a space like mutual funds where i felt that there is a lot to do this is 14 years ago because there's so much of misselling and all sorts of things happening but at that time because of lack of technology and lack of reach we were not able to work with a large number of investors but 15 years later today i am able to work with a very large number of investors and i can work with an even larger number of investors using technology there is no geographical restriction today so i am looking at how i can help improve the financial health of thousands of people for whom there is a need and not much help so that is the area where i am seeking contentment today 
i am not really worried about uh, how much money we make uh, you know in this exercise because the kind of money that i can make as an investor i can never dream of making in all these activities but i have actually kind of put my personal investment journey on some kind of a slow burner because i am quite happy with what i have today and i would just allow it to grow to the best extent it can and work on how can i create a similar experience for as many people as i am approached by so that is what has been my journey by actually taking away the focus from what is my net worth and how much am i going to grow it into and you know personal measurement or intense pursuit of personal wealth i have actually moved away from that another area where i am definitely getting contentment is um, in uh, helping people who are uh, seeking out like uh, there are a lot of uh, social activity where i am able to indulge in which gives me a lot of happiness so these are two areas where i am definitely looking at uh, uh, you know uh, making some difference by my efforts and i think that when you are uh, seeking contentment through effort uh, it's much higher than uh, i mean it's much it's a much higher form of satisfaction than seeking contentment through just capital to just devolution of capital so also by doing all these things you don't have time to seek any other contentment you cannot uh, because you are fully busy doing all these things so that way uh, i am fully tied up and i don't have time to worry whether i uh, need something else so that way i am fully tied up and i am very happy doing what i am doing 6 days a week 8:45 to 7 pm so i am not worried that i am not coming on cnbc or uh, i am not worried that i don't have this many followers on twitter or i am not worried that i am not my videos are not watched by more people these things don't bother me at all i think i i, I come from the same field as well and uh, i also appreciate the fact uh, which i have been trying to practice in my life is that just doing the work is enough right rather than trying to seek credit or trying to seek contentment somewhere else i outside i think just doing the work keeps you contented i think that's the best thing that can happen to you in your life right? Uh, no, if you keep doing it somewhere, somebody will come and tell you, sir, I learned this. I may was doing this wrong, so now I am all right. Somebody will come and say a few things. That is contentment. If he is happy, we are happy. That's all. That is true. So briefly, for the benefit of audience, what are the various uh, places where you are helping investors out? So what are the various services that you provide or your firm provides which can help people out? See, right at the bottom of the pyramid, through the mutual funds, we have created a program called Milestones to Wealth, where I am trying to take. Ten thousand people to one crore, and I have set milestones: two lakhs, five lakhs, ten lakhs, twenty-five lakhs, fifty lakhs, and one crore. Six milestones somebody has to cross. So we teach them simple things like ensuring that uh, they do a financial health check, they know their risk profiling, they know their uh, civil score, and they invest regularly. And whenever opportunities are more in their favor the logic is if i can this is like a pilot if i can achieve this for 10000 people then you can scale it up much higher so basically my sense is that you have to give a very simple investment experience to people which is not taking them down a slippery slope which keeps them away from all the hard parts of the market all the frothy parts of the market and takes them where opportunity is in their favor at the time when it is the appropriate time so these are things which we know as investors our experience has given us this basic awareness and that awareness is with me and probably 20 people with whom i used to interact with now i am trying to take it to 10000 people i am only using mutual funds i am not using anything else maybe some etfs and we want to use that and take people on that slope that is a gradient which people will climb and you know go to one crore then we have the pms where we are working with uh, multiple uh, clients uh, in giving them an investment experience uh, where we are not running the race with any other product we are running to a certain 
philosophy uh, which the product clearly uh, outlines and we'll stick to that and uh, by doing that we take lesser risks and hopefully give decent returns and so far the journey has been good and that's the second thing we also tried our hand at uh, in, uh, registered investment advisory uh, but uh, the environment is uh, no more conducive for that so we have completely paused that activity uh, it's very unfortunate but we had no choice because uh, the environment is completely not conducive to working in that space but hopefully someday when the environment turns better we would also pursue that space more actively one of my favorite uh... Uh, statements from Jeff Bezos is when he says and I quote that anybody who does not change their mind a lot is dramatically underestimating the complexity of the world we live in. Uh, I go back to that statement from time to time and reflect on small and big things I have changed my mind on over the years. So two questions here with respect to investing and decision making. First is where and how do you think we should draw a line between being fickle minded or indecisive and being adaptive to new information and perspectives? and to what is the most important thing you have changed your mind on in the past 5 years investing or outside of it well, there are multiple areas where you are forced to change your mind because your opinions are contextual your opinions are contextual and you have to adapt to the context but you need not adapt every month you adapt when the reason is strong and that if you don't adapt the consequences are not going to be good so actually it should be at the point where there is a very strong reason and if you don't accept that reason it's going to actually harm you so you have to have that uh, kind of a patience there are multiple instances i can tell you so one was with relation to capital goods companies 2008 i was extremely negative on capital goods companies by 2017 9 years later i was extremely positive on capital goods companies because all the negative reasons which i held against them were fully dealt with and they were on the way out in 2017 you cut to 2021 and you will see that post covid you could clearly see a completely different dimension in those companies and today you see the valuation of those companies right so in 2008 i might have been a very very strong critic of capital goods companies but the same companies became investments 12 years later and i am looking at them 9 years later 9 and 12 years is the conviction building phase so that is one good example where a very prominent example where i change my opinion and this happens all the time i would say this happens all the time because the context changes see at the bottom of a credit cycle you look at rating as a business very differently than you would at the top of a credit cycle right so at the top of a credit cycle i may be an ardent critic of rating businesses but at the bottom of the credit cycle i can't be an ardent critic because i know from there there's only one way and that's up and the market knows that it's the bottom of the credit cycle the market will always uh, reflect and it will always uh, show its uh, emotions in the stock price so the circumstances change your opinions change your conviction changes i don't think you can have one view on anything in this world i know a lot of people say oh mr buffett was buffett or i know a lot of people say mr buffett was bearish on this at this point in time but now look at what he is saying but he is completely entitled to do so because the environment is not the same between the two time lines between those two points in time so it applies to all of us and we must have an open mind to change our opinion when there is a strong reason we should not change it just for the sake of changing our opinion i know a lot of people change their opinion every 3 months i am not suggesting that but when there is a very strong reason i think we should not be shy to change our opinion 
you mentioned that you've connected to a lot of social initiatives uh, i'm sure uh, maybe some of them uh, would be in education uh, we're living in a world where the pace of change is multiplying even as our formal education system seems insufficient to teach all that is required to thrive uh, uh, in this world in this complex and ever changing world uh, given this what advice would you offer to students and young adults in self educating themselves and what are some of the key work and life skills they must learn or they should learn to do really well over the next few decades firstly i want them to have an open mind because in today's uh, social media era there are people from all sides trying to brainwash you and in the process you are not being allowed to develop a mind of your own when i was a youngster i had that opportunity because i had less noise today you are only shown things aligning to what you have just seen suppose you watch one video you will see 10 videos of the same type again the algorithms are actually taking you away from free thinking so i think that you should be very conscious in seeking other views suppose you have a view learn the opposite view learn all the opinions and then decide where you stand i think this applies to politics it applies to economics it applies to everything you do including your choice of restaurants and movies so i think that you need to uh, open up and become your own judge and don't take assistance in judging anything learn to judge by yourself and i am sure you will be a better judge than all those who are craving to assist you that is my simple advice to anyone and it applies as much to your investing don't be parrots don't watch somebody including me and blindly take what we tell you you form your own opinion and uh, be your own master because then you have your best chance of being better than all of us whom you are watching that's and also having the ability and also that's how i think you also develop the ability to change your mind when the facts change if you are if you're doing it on your own if you if you if you're having that open mind and i think uh, uh, this is what morgan housel told me in the session that i had with him that the ability to uh, listen to differing views right conflicting views and sometimes accept them even when they go against your views i think that's a superpower in today's world where people uh, uh, just Uh, are not willing to listen to others and or the opposing views i think that's a superpower if you can do that uh, you've been in the markets for 35 years you've grown as an individual as well uh, looking back at your journey a long journey what's one piece of advice you wish you could have given your younger self when you were just starting out in the world of finance and investing in case you were given an opportunity to give one piece of advice it's very simple give your ideas more time it's one sentence a very simple one because when you see where they went later you realize how vulnerable you are with those ideas it is overcoming that vulnerability which is your duty to yourself that's true so true what's the most important life and money skills you have tried to imbibe in your children and related question what has surprised you the most in being a parent that you never thought before becoming one so i have not uh, consciously tried to school my children on too many things so i would always think that uh, that can be done later as long as they are fine doing what they are doing and enjoying what they are doing and willing to do new things find interests uh, learn as they do things i was okay with it so i would think that my children don't know much about my world but i am increasingly surprised about how much they know about my world and what i have done and about things which i have not spoken with them like um, how they should view money uh, how they should uh, handle money how they should spend these are things which i have never tried to school them so i thought that they are probably not very familiar with that i'm surprised at how familiar they are which means that they are learning on their own so that is something that uh, surprised me a friend of mine said that uh, the children always learn by observing what you do uh, i think nothing can be more accurate i think uh, that has been what surprised me because i have not really spent time to tell them every little thing there are parents who 
you know tell children every little thing i am not one of those parents wonderful uh two questions combined into one what is the single best piece of advice you ever got and what is the single worst piece of advice you ever got which in hindsight became a worse worst advice a bad advice the best advice is be your own person my mentor told me not to be like anybody else or aspire to be like anybody else be your own person that's the first thing be yourself i don't think you need to be somebody else that's the best advice <laughs> the worst advice is uh, that uh, you know you you must go out and be seen which never worked for me but i still did get that advice from a lot of people uh, in the stock market and uh, found it quite uh, unbearable actually you you you've won multiple hats uh, uh, sham over the past many years you've been an entrepreneur you've been an investor you've been an educator right uh, and some somewhere i read that you also sometime wanted to be a creative writer right if not yes. for investor if that is right so in an alternate universe if you were not an investor what do you think you would have been in by i would have been in uh, some discipline that involves uh, writing Uh, creative writing music stuff like that something like that that is what i wanted to be and uh, i am here because i couldn't be there it's not the other way around <laughs> <laughs> but i'm sure you can i'm sure you're still pursuing those kind of activities and passion on the sidelines in terms Actually, of writing and music i did not for uh, nearly two decades but once i started i thought i'm doing everything i'm writing i'm speaking a lot of things happened once i embarked on that entrepreneurial journey and nothing happened by uh, any plan it's just taking me there step by step so uh, i'm writing a lot more i want to do, do journalism i write columns now i never dreamt i would come back to writing so somewhere the journey is just leading me on so that way i am enjoying it because uh, there was no plan and uh, i don't know how i'm here doing all this that's right you 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 mentioned uh, early in the conversation that you were very scared of public speaking uh, and suddenly you were asked to speak up uh, in a vernacular language so do you remember what topic did you speak about oh it was in tamil it was on uh, one of the classics of tamil it was a it was a elocution in tamil so okay. yeah my mouth went dry i couldn't speak i was so scared the stage fright it was class 8 or something like that after that i never spoke for 4 years but the teacher kept on telling me that you can do it and then another teacher took over and he kept on telling me and then suddenly accidentally i started speaking again i had not act, rehearsed or improved uh, myself or tried anything it was just that i had gone over the hump of confidence that's all i am sure this applies to investing also for a lot of people that suddenly they discover themselves and they start learning and then you know somewhere your confidence starts growing that's i think it's a feedback loop right the more you do the more you put yourself in those kind of uncomfortable situations which you think are good which we are not going to kill you i think you just become a better version of yourself in that activity so. yes suddenly a friend of mine told me to go on a tv debate in tamil i was not even sure whether i can speak in tamil because it is 20 years uh, since i had done anything like that uh, even remotely connected to that but then i started doing it and i started enjoying it speaking in the language that i didn't enjoy the debate but i enjoyed speaking in the language and then subsequently that learning i am using to speaking on education investor education in that language so somewhere something i did adds up to something else so i don't really i don't have a balance sheet for this but somewhere it balances by itself i'm sure i'm sure uh, are there any specific books or philosophies or thinkers inside or outside of finance or investing that have shaped your approach to investing decision making in life if you were to name some outside of finance i would any day think of only one person it is tiruvalluvar the saint who wrote the tirukkural i think uh, you can on any subject get wisdom from his books so that way very concise and very easy to read outside of finance i, I think he is probably the best thinker i have seen 1330 couplets they will live for eternity any one that you want want to share with us now uh, there is one which is related to the social media era which says that whatever you protect or not protect your tongue don't say something which you should not say because if you do that then you will have to live by what you said any any specific books i think uh, in the cfa talk you mentioned about zurich axioms 
right uh, yes. apart from that is there any other book or if you just want to talk about that book or why why do you really like that book uh, in the first place because uh, it comes from the perspective of a trader and uh, i'm not a trader but i'm more of an investor but uh, whatever they say in that book as axioms helps us as investors to overcome a lot of our uh, innate defects there are some belief systems in investors which don't make us act fast enough i think that that book basically it cuts through all this and says you have to act when it is a time to act and i like that part uh, so uh, sham we we in the end almost at the end of the conversation it's been it's been a, such an insight, insightful conversation for me uh, my closing question to you is that everyone walks on their own journey of life and everyone must play their parts well whatever part they are playing but what according to you is a life well lived i think a life well lived is one where you feel that you have no regret i think if one is able to leave this world with no regret i think that's a life well lived and that's what all of us pray for hopefully we all get it wonderful with that uh, thank you so much sham for uh, spending these two hours with me uh, uh, it's been great insightful lessons lot of learnings from you lot of learnings repeated uh, but i think uh, that's the idea of learning things again from wise people that you need to drill them down to really learn like you mentioned about uh, pursuing an idea for 10 15 years and then acting on it writing i think it's a constant learning that i've had from you that we've been interacting off and on for the last 10 years but it's it's been a great journey for me as well learning from you and especially today where we spent two dedicated hours uh, on your insight so thank you so much again for all that thank you vishal it was a pleasure and uh, i hope uh, to interact more with you in the future and uh, i wish you all the best in your efforts to educate young people and i'm sure you're making an impact which will be lasting and growing thank you very much thank you so much yeah Thank you.